Professor Eric Desaro from the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle in the US for today's uh, seminar. This is a seminar, uh, this is the 12th seminar in the series that we have been conducting under the research initiative Geophysical Close Lab. Eric has also been visiting us uh, multiple times over the last one year with this uh, Geophysical uh, Close Lab research initiative. Hope that he will be visiting us multiple times in the future as well. He has a wide range of expertise uh, in physical oceanography. Apart in addition to studying several problems on the ocean physics, he's also interested in developing and building instruments for making measurements. Okay, good. Um, I'm happy to be here again. Been in this room a lot of times giving these talks, and I've met many of you. So um, we're talking about sort of forward-looking, how, how will we measure the ocean in the future? A long time ago, when I was a graduate student, we could look back to a time where the only way people could measure the ocean was to have a, a big cable coming down from the ship, and a big guy, usually without a shirt, somehow that's the way it worked, um, with a bottle, and you'd send the bottle down to the ocean, and then it would capture the water, and it would come back, and then you'd do something with the water. Nowadays, we have a vast array of instruments, which I'm going to be talking about in this talk. So, um, the problem we have solving, that we need to solve, is that the ocean's really complicated. If you look at the background image here, it's an image of temperature from a model. We're going to see this again later, so that's cold and that's hot. And what you see is there's a lot of stuff going on. Sometimes it, it's wiggling all over the place. Lots of small features, and the ocean's pretty big. So if you want to measure that, you need a lot of measurements. Um, a whole lot in order to see all this stuff. And we didn't used to be able to do it with that. Now we have all sorts of tools that can measure that. How do you use those tools? Um, this is an ocean model. Ocean simulation models are a big part of oceanography these days. They can pull in the data, they can make forecasts, and they're imperfect. And one of the big goals of oceanographic research is to improve these models through understanding them better. That's what science thinks, is that if you understand things better, you'll be able to predict them better. Artificial intelligence is challenging that, but that's a different talk. And the question is, how do we use these new tools? Now, you may well come away from this talk a bit, a bit confused about this and that and the other thing, but I'm trying to more give you an impression of where I think the field is and some interesting engineering problems. If you don't remember all the details, that's just fine. It's more of an impression than a, than a you know, detailed particular thing talk. OK, so I'm from University of Washington in Seattle. It's a lovely campus. That's the campus. It's right here in the Northeast United States. We've got this tower called the Space Needle. We have this mountain nearby, many mountains. This one's called Mount Rainier. You'll see that later. I'm at a place called the Applied Physics Laboratory. It's a research laboratory within the University of Washington. We don't grant degrees, but we have many students at the laboratory. It's a, top, it's a collection of about 300 scientists, engineers, and technicians. She's a chief scientist on a cruise I was associated with a few years ago. Uh, she's a student, and he's, a, I, don't, I don't know if he's an engineer or a technician, but you know, that's what he is. This is some instrument. Um, we build stuff. That's what the engineers are about, and that's a thing. I build, and there it is. Looks like it's falling off the boat. Yes, it is indeed falling off the boat, but don't worry, it was meant to do that because it was meant to go out of airplanes into tropical cyclones, so falling out of the boat really isn't a big deal. It was, meant, it was designed to do that. And um, I've also been coming to India now for about a decade. That's myself on a cruise of the Sagarnini a few years ago with the basis of Nanda and two of his, grad and two of his graduate students at the time. Oops, and um, well, this is good enough. OK, so this is the output from a numerical model. That's a, that's a few years old. So there's India. This is salinity. So that's uh, fresh water in the Bay of Bengal. That's salt water in the Arabian Sea. And uh, all these little wiggles and things are all sorts of little eddies and swirls, which are the complexity of the ocean. Um, this is a model. This is a model output, which means that it takes the equations of motion, of fluid motion, and solves them. And since we believe that the equations of fluid motions are indeed the correct equations that describe the ocean, you would think that might be perfect, but it's not because it's only an approximation of the equations of motion because there's a finite grid, and because although there's lots of scales here, you know, 
from thousands of kilometers to maybe a kilometer or two. There's a lot more scales that aren't resolved, and those have to be added into the model somehow, and that's not terrific. And you need boundary conditions, and they're never perfect. That technology, the model technology, is now used broadly in two different ways. In what we might call operational models, the idea of that is to make an ocean weather forecast. Try to make, in your computer, a duplicate world, and then you can ask it what's going to happen and uh, what's happening now. To run such a model, like an ocean weather forecast, just like a real weather forecast, you need data to make sure that the model in your computer is trying to mimic the world as it exists as opposed to some other world that existed in some other time or never existed. To do that, you need a thing called an ocean observing system that gets data. And the important thing about that is it has to get data all the time in the same way and be plugged into the model. The process of moving it from the observations, which are sort of it's whatever you can do, to inside the model is called data assimilation. There appears to be a big shortage of data assimilation people in the world in meteorology and oceanography. So if you're good at linear algebra and like to get into the nuances of differential equations and you think that might be fun, you've probably got a job there. Uh, not that I know much about it, but I'm pretty sure that there's a shortage of those people. The problem with these sort of models is it's hard to tell why the weather forecast was wrong today, because it's a really complicated thing. So other class of models are called research models. The goal of those is to understand the ocean better and to make these models better. They need a different type of data. They need intensive high resolution data to provide critical tests of the model. And the process of taking, of taking special data, putting it in an ocean model, and trying to use it to understand the ocean is, is now called an ocean process experiment. That's what I do, and that's mostly what I'm going to describe. So anyway. So, um, the first big ocean process experiment was called, wait for something to happen, there we go, was called MODE in 1973. It happened just before I, I was a graduate student. Here's the United States, here's the East Coast of the United States, there's Florida, and this is a region they picked to measure, and they put all the ocean observation assets that basically existed in the world at that time, it was about that many, put them all in the rain, left them out there for a few months. And they wanted to ask two questions. One is, do all those little wiggles, the ocean eddies, do they really exist? There was just a hint that they existed. And the answer, as you can see in this little ocean, this little assimilation that I did, little data assimilating, that's what it was. Back then, it was the first, gonna go, it might go. Um, it was the first data assimilation thing. There it goes, that's, that's the data assimilation and running a model for data. And yes, they did indeed exist. And then the next question is, uh, what equations uh, predict that? And here's a diagnostic. You don't need to know what it was in detail. And the answer was that there's a particular set of equations that are indeed governed by these observations as best they could tell. The ocean circulation models, like you saw in the previous slide, are the grandchildren of this experiment. Once you had these equations and you had done this, you could easily see that if I could get enough data to make this model run, I could make a prediction. So that's 1973. And it also, in a sociological way, showed us how, at that time, a large fraction of the physical oceanographers in the world would get together in a temporary arrangement to make data like this and then go do something else. So this was a really, um, seminal thing that happened. I must have gotten into the field at just the right time, just after it. There's a wonderful movie online that you could watch, which has got all sorts of old, now either old or not with us anymore, oceanographers explaining how this all worked back in 73. Okay, so what comes next is a tour of ocean measurement tools. Only those that measure temperature, salinity, and velocity, the primary measurements for physical oceanography. Um, there's many other ones, but I just needed to live at the top. And this may be sort of blurry, but this will be fun. If you're an engineer, this has got lots of interesting stuff in it, I hope. Particularly if I can change the slide. Hmm, interesting. Try over here. There we go, that worked. Okay, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Okay, so the 
the classical way to measure things in the ocean is to go out in a boat. There's a picture of the Indian boat Sagarniti. I've been out a few times. India has some really nice research vessels. Um, you know, they can do almost everything. Um, instead of having one guy with the, you know, without the shirt at the bottom of the water, there are contraptions here that have 24 miles. It's a lot better and it gets a lot more water a lot faster. And there's wonderful stories about how this works, but the answer is it works pretty well. There's one company that makes them all and uh, keeps, and that's, that's good for that company. However, um, such the best the, the oceanographic ships have a number of problems. One is that there's not very many of them in the world. They're extremely expensive to run. Hundred thousand dollars a day is not unheard of, and uh, they're really slow. They go as fast as a bicycle. Okay, that's not very fast. They can only stay out for many, a few to many weeks because the people want to go home. They need fresh food. They have all sorts of complaints as to why they can't stay out. Um, there's pirates. You know, they don't like, the people on the boat don't like pirates, so they can't go there. And, and there's only one place at one time. Um, in the 1990s, after the boat experiment, it was decided to survey the whole world with oceanographic vessels. And they spent seven years to do the whole world. Those are all the lines they did. And they got 9,000 profiles from the surface to the bottom of the ocean of lots and lots of different things. And that was global coverage, and this really was a landmark. But as you'll see, it sort of pales to what, what we can do these days. So, many beyond ship slides, only one of them says beyond ships. One, another critical part of oceanography today is satellite remote sensing. It's really made an enormous difference. You could have a whole talk on that. Um, but basically, you can measure ocean temperature, either by microwave emissions or by visual, by infrared. The infrared is blocked by clouds. You can measure ocean salinity, not very well, but a lot better than nothing. And you can measure the color of the ocean, which is a complicated quantity. Um, and you can measure stuff about the biology. The other thing you can do for oceanography is you can measure very small deviations of the surface of the ocean, of order of a meter, it tends to a few centimeters which are due to the motions of the water and reference them to the geoid and you can measure that with satellites and that tells you ocean currents, turns out. Um, India is a, builds all these types of satellites, has been a real leader and until um, SpaceX was the cost leader in ocean launch on the SpaceX. But we'll see what happens in the future. I'm not gonna talk much about this except to point out that the one thing that satellites have done from a conceptual view of what the ocean is like, is they've really showed the complexity of the ocean. If, if you haven't heard me say the word complexity, you will hear it many times. If there's only one thing you get out of this talk, there's, a, there's one of them. Okay, here's the US, Canada, Cuba, Florida, and here's a very high quality ocean uh, temperature image. That's hot, that's cold, you know, it's cold water up here, two degrees, down here it's 28 degrees, and there's a current called the Gulf Stream. It comes up like this. And you can see there's like wiggles all over the place. All these eddies on different scale. And uh, you can measure this stuff. Now, obviously, there it is. There's a measure of it. Over on the right-hand side, you can see certain ocean color, even more complicated. There's a 100-kilometer feature. There's a 5-kilometer feature. Um, this complexity is a huge challenge for observations. How could you possibly understand and measure something so complicated? Well, the answer is with difficulty. But, and with merging, I mean, maybe this is the theme. If you had an observation from a, doesn't matter what it was, but in the ocean, and you had an observation here, you had an observation here, you would have no idea what's going on. But if you had this image at the same time, you would have a very good idea about what's going on. That's the sort of theme. Can you mix these things in different ways to get that sort of synergy? That's really the point. Okay. Another old standard in oceanography is an oceanographic mooring. It consists of a weight at the bottom of the ocean, some sort of a strong cable, something either on the surface or near the surface, and lots of stuff hung on the cable. Um, this is a real mainstay of oceanography. You can get very high resolution. Uh, you can have something on the surface, which then you know can telemeter back, or you can have something on the subsurface that's invisible and nobody much will bother it except fishermen. Um, India has a very strong capability in this, based out of NRIT in Chennai. All the red dots are long-term moorings maintained by India, and they're, 
and they, they do really an excellent and impressive job on that. Um, but it, it's very mature technology, shall we say. Doesn't mean it's bad, it's just mature. Another reasonably mature uh, technology is what's called surface drifters. The idea is that you take something that's designed to float on the surface and follow the surface currents. It's the modern equivalent of taking a bottle, writing your name in it, throwing it in the water, and hope someone will find it and tell you where it went. But you have a satellite tracker in it, and, you, and that's really very simple, and, and there's some subtlety in designing it so it follows the water. But you can deploy a lot of them because they're cheap. Here's a whole lot of them on a boat. This is a biodegradable plastic, and so that's better than a non-biodegradable plastic. Around India, these are a problem. Not so difficult because near the coastal zone, there's so much fishing that they just end up, the fishermen get them, and that's not what you had in mind. Nevertheless, I'm going to show over here a really remarkable observation. Here we go. Come on. OK. So this is uh, about 300 drifters that were put out in the Gulf of Mexico a few years ago. And you can see they're swirling around in some sort of eddy. And after a while, they organize themselves. That shows you a lot about the organization of the ocean. You notice they're all getting closer together. And they're getting closer together. They're going round and round in a circular eddy. And there, after about a week and a half, the drifters were in a region that was about 20 kilometers square a lot bigger than this campus, and they ended up in a region that was about 60 meters across the size of the stadium. It, it sort of it looks like a big uh, counterclockwise rotating bathtub vortex where all the water goes down. Well, that's, that's exactly right. If a whole lot of water from a wide region was originally spread out here, and is now all here, the only place it could have gone was that. So, and the only reason you could do that, so you're measuring vertical transport, which is a very hard thing to measure, with a whole lot of horizontal measurements. It's a real nice example of how a whole lot of simple measurements can um, substitute for one really complicated measurement. So that's fun. Um, the instrument that is probably made besides satellites, or with satellites and modeling, the biggest change in oceanography in the last decade or two of what's called Argo floats. It's a thing about the size of a person. It's got some sensors on it. It does this mission over and over again. It starts out at the surface, sinks down to 1,000 meters, waits for eight to, ten, eight to nine days, goes down with 2,000 meters. It's about halfway down the ocean. That's just as deep as they can make them. It comes up, and on the way up, it, it measures with very high precision temperature, salinity, and pressure, and then reports it back to a satellite. Pretty simple. Um, it's costing us about $200 a profile. You're never going to get a profile for less than $200 in the other way. Um, they got very organized at the right time, and there's an international Argo program, and countries all over the world buy these and put them in the ocean. India plays a big role in the Indian Ocean. And right now, there are about 4,000 floats out in the ocean, and over the last 20 years, they've collected 2 million profiles which is a whole lot better than the 9,000 that the ships did a few years ago. So this is really quite remarkable. Argo tells us a great many things. Probably the simplest and easiest to understand is illustrated in this figure. This is depth to 2,000 meters. This is 2004. This is 2022. The color is the change in temperature relative to something. And you can see that it starts out blue and it ends up red by about a, a, twentieth of a degree, and uh, so the ocean's warming. That should be a surprise. Should not be a surprise, but it's very hard to argue with this. With this, all of these thermometers are calibrated in the same place against the same standard. They're all basically the same, and they're distributed uniformly over the Earth. There's no place for the heat to hide. And although this isn't a big temperature change, if you were to say how much of this heat were in the air instead of the water, because, of, because water can hold so much more heat. This is actually most of the heat has gone into the ocean. So, okay. that, and there's many other things, but that's a simple story. Um, simple question, simple answer to the question, suppose you want to measure something in the ocean. The first question you should ask is, could this technology do it? Because all you got to do is take your money, send it to the manufacturer, get the float, and throw it in the ocean, and then look on the web, and you're done. Um, 
There are many reasons that you might not want to do that. For example, there are many things in life which are unsure, and even more things that are unsure in measurement. But one thing you're quite sure of is that if you put a float there, it will never be there again. <laughs> you don't know where it will be, but it will never be there again. <laughs> which, which is a silly way to say that these are floating, and so they go wherever they want, and you don't know where they're going to go. And the, the beauty of Argo was the, was the idea that this random sampling would be of great value. That was a real conceptual thing, conceptual progress. Okay, you could, the, the float technology has many specialized applications too. This is a thing that I build called the Lagrangian float. Uh, one thing it does is, so what it does is it's an instrument that's very carefully designed to have the same density as water, therefore it moves in three dimensions with the water, like a little parcel of dirt in a laboratory PIV experiment, and we do can do this, this was deployed in this particular case in the same place as those swirling dots that sank down, and so if you put it near the surface, it eventually finds the uh, sinkhole, it's not a sinkhole, but you see what I mean, and then it goes down, so that goes with the other measured evidence to show they really was down dwelling. Um, it's hard to do, the thing weighs 50 kilos, and you've got to get the weight right to a gram or two, so that's uh, one part in the fifth or sixth. And we can measure stuff along the way. In particular, we can put an acoustic measuring thing on it and measure the velocity both from how the float moves and from that, and they agree, it turns out. Um, you'll see a little bit about this in the future. OK. More interesting from an engineering point of view, now you've got a um, instrument, either an Argo float or one of the other floats, that's got a buoyancy inch. In other words, it can change its buoyancy. It can go up and down. That means there's energy, and normally they just dissipate the energy. But you can put that energy to useful work, work by putting wings on the float, which is, yeah, I can say that, but it's a whole lot more complicated. Because now you're building a flying vehicle, and therefore it can fly sideways as it goes up and down. This is called a glider. And there are several varieties of them. Um, this one was designed at, eight, at my lab. The, uh, the commercial one that seems to be winning out um, is operated by, uh, by India. And here are two examples of them that are being used in the Bay of Bengal. Many, many strengths to this technology. It can drive to remote, to remote locations. In other words, you can go out just offshore, just deep enough that you don't get stuck in the mud, and say, go. And off it goes. You go home, and do whatever you're going to do at home, pop it on the computer, and uh, go wherever you're going to go, and come back, and then you can go out, you know, nine months later and pick it up. That's, and you didn't need a ship. There's a laboratory in. Um, on the island of Mallorca in the Mediterranean, it was a new lab, and they decided that instead of investing in a fancy building or a, uh, a ship or something, they would invest in the technology of gliders. So that they had, and so this was, this was, if you've got all these choices, you can decide to structure your organizations around different technologies, and they decided to structure around gliders. Um, like I said, you can stay out for a long time, you can get the data in real time, Glider goes 20 times slower than a ship. Very slow. But you have 20 gliders, now you've got the same ability to survey that you had with a ship. And not only that, they're in different places at the same time, so you're not making any assumptions about you know, space and time. Um, and they're commercially available, but it's a sort of a specialist thing still to operate them. They are very, very slow, 20 kilometers a day. That's why they can go for a long time, because they're, they're not putting all the energy into dissipation. If you put one in at Chennai and you want to go to the Andaman Islands, a sensible thing to do, it takes two months. Well, what else you got to do with the through that? So just do it for you. Uh, they're also quite low power and they have to be a special shape because they're an aerodynamic vehicle, so they have rather limited payloads. But just to give you an example of the type of thing you can do, this is the Gulf Stream again off the west of the east coast of the United States. Here's a strong current uh, going, um, and uh, they deployed a lot of gliders in here. Doesn't, the details don't matter. And so they could make these maps as you go north, averaged over many years of what the structure of this current was, with about, about 20,000 glider profiles. So that's an impressive thing that you couldn't have done, say, when I was a graduate student. I was a graduate student. Someday you might look like me, um, <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, a really interesting new class of vehicles are what are called autonomous surface vehicles. These are environmentally powered boats. So here's, here are two types. Uh, one's called a sail drone. You can see how big it is. It's a robotic sailboat. So it's got all the advantages and disadvantages of a sailboat. 
like when the wind isn't blowing, it doesn't go. And if the wind is blowing and the wind's blowing from that direction and you want to go that direction, you can't go that direction directly, you have to tack. But they got all the programs to do that and um, works pretty well. Um, here's another one called a wave glider. This is a very strange vehicle, I think. So it's a surfboard sized thing. It's got a long, about a six meter cable attached to it. On the bottom of it is this funny looking thing. There's a blow up in the video. So it's a wave powered boat. When the boat goes up, you're dragging this thing up. You have little flappies that moves that in the forward direction. When the waves go down, this thing falls down. The flappies flap the other way and it goes the other way. Now, I'm not an aeronautical or hydrological engineer, really, but it strikes me that there's probably a better way than this to achieve this effect. This really looks, it really was put together by like a whale scientist, and, and then he's, you know. So my guess is you could be a whole lot, that was, you really need 10 aerodynamic surfaces and a flip-flopper, about one aerodynamic surface and like some control surfaces, you know. So there's a, there's a fun project to do. I think there's plenty of space in this world to, to do, to, for new designs. Um, of course, you can just get a gas-powered boat and put a controller in it, and off you go. And that's a pretty good way to do it, too, but it's not sexy like these. These have very long endurance because they're entirely environmentally um, powered. They can carry heavy sensors because they're pretty big and they got lots of power. They send you data continuously. They're slow, but you know, they're faster than other things. And, if, and when they stop, when the wind stops, the waves don't stop very often, so these keep going. So they, they are very promising. They're very promising and interesting technology. Both of these are commercial and are pretty expensive to operate, but you just pay them the money and you get the data. You don't need any expertise. I probably missed something. Um, there's certainly ideas that I missed. Um, here's the rest of this talk. Okay, I mentioned, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe a dozen, depending on how you count, different types of tools. How do you put them all together? There's an awful lot of choices. Which one should I use? There may be there are two types of answers. Well, I have this one, so I should use it. My boss tells me I should use this one. Those are all reasons. They're good reasons, but it's important in your head to keep clear which ones you're doing because it's the best thing to do and which ones you're doing for other reasons. And I'm just going with the science part of it. There are other reasons to do things. Um, OK. The second thing I hope you can take away from this is that I think the most fundamental question you need to ask, or a very fundamental question you need to ask if you're measuring something in geophysics, is what space and time scales did you wish to measure? The Earth's at a very large range of space and time scales. I'm going to illustrate that with this. This is a Google Earth picture of Mount Rainier, our local volcano. You can see there's some cars, this is the visitor center, you can go here. And this is a big canyon that the glacier cut. Um, and so this picture is a geophysical measurement. It's got a certain number of pixels. And you can, you know, can you see a person? It's a person here somewhere. Maybe that's a person. You can tell that that's a person. There's one pixel for a person. So, and but given those pixels, you could decide to measure that. Or if you wanted to, you could, you could decide to measure all of, my, all of Mount Rainier, so there's all of Mount Rainier, or you could decide to measure the mountain range that Mount Rainier is in, or you could decide to measure all of Washington State, or all of North America, or the whole world, or the place of the whole world in the, um, in the universe, or the solar system. It's the same number of pixels, but you just get to choose where you're going to put those pixels. The circumference of the Earth which is the largest scale that geophysicists would measure, is about 10 to the 8th meters. A virus, which is probably the smallest scale, is 10 to the minus 7. There's 15 orders of magnitude. It's a, lot, it's a whole lot. No model or no measurement system is going to get the ball. Google Earth gets pretty close, but you see that was only halfway there. You have to make a limited range of scales. That determines what you're going to see. For Argo, they were very explicit about it. They wanted to measure the deep water world ocean on a monthly time scale the upper 2,000 meters at a resolution of one degree horizontally and a resolution of a few meters vertically. Okay, that's what you get, and it's fabulous. And they measure it really well. And you can go online and you can find all over the world all the time 
everywhere, almost everywhere, um, beta at that resolution. Perfect. Because they thought it out beforehand. Okay. Let's talk it one more focus with time. I think we're doing okay. Um, talk now about a specific measurement problem called the ocean sub mesoscale, which is a, re a research area of interest now, one that I'm working on. And uh, so this is uh, a satellite picture of several things I'll tell you in a moment. Here's India, here's Bangladesh, Miramar, some Burma down here. And those are clouds, but because the clouds block it out. But this is a nice cloud free picture taken in December, northeast monsoon in the Bay of Bengal. There's the Ganges River. The gray scale is color with a little bit of enhancement so the gradients in color stand out to make it look a little like a three dimensional object. See that the, a dominant thing that happens at this time of year in the Bay of Bengal is that fresh water comes out of the Ganges, a little bit of the Irrawaddy, the one here, and spreads out over the Bay of Bengal. So this, so you can sort of see this water over here as being the water that's coming out of the Ganges. But this is a measure of temperature, not salinity. What's happening is that the river water is in a very thin layer. The northeast monsoon is cooling it, so the fresh water shows up as cold. Normally, you, would have, you couldn't see this. And what you see is all the cold water over here and hot water over here. This is fresh. This is saltier. The yellow contours are contours of surface pressure from altimeters, satellite altimeters, and the surface currents to a high degree of accuracy or to good enough are, follow, are parallel to these contours. So you can see the water coming out of the Ganges River flowing southward like this, and then here's a little eddy of them, and here's the hot water which is just circulating around. So that's good. What I want to point out is the bit, is the quantity of small scales and fronts. There are all sorts of little features that are coming out. Um, a very sharp boundary between the whitish stuff and the darkish stuff in the middle here. The physical understanding that was gained in the mode one experiment back in uh, 73 and he elaborated a whole lot over the last however long that was 50 years 50 years something like that since then does not predict the presence of all small-scale features you need more detailed physics these small-scale features we think are quite important in how this salty water and fresh water mixed together and end up and, and end up controlling temperature and other things in, in the Bay of Bengal, a good example. But that's true everywhere. So an area of research in physical oceanography right now is submesoscale oceanography, all the scales. And this presents an even more challenging measurement problem because there's even more, even more examples of small stuff in the ocean than there are examples of big stuff in the ocean. So it's a very challenging measurement problem. We'll talk about that. Okay. In particular, in the context of a process, ocean process experiment that we just finished up, or finished up the first part of, called ESMO. I did not name this experiment. I would not name an experiment to follow up my own because I wouldn't be brave enough. I have enough respect for those guys. But I didn't name it. So you can see the idea. Self mesoscale mode. We're going to be as famous as the mode people. Well, I, I don't think so. But that's all right. Um, the idea was to test the hypothesis that these small sub mesoscale things are important, in particular, because you might have a layer of fresh water, or lighter water here, warmer or fresher, a sharp front between them, and then this water will be sliding underneath that water. That's basically the process. We used all these fancy instruments that I was describing off the coast of California. That's a state-of-the-art um, model. Some of the other doesn't matter what it is. The point is, you see a whole lot of really, really fine stuff. And the thing which made this sort of experiment doable now was that models are starting to predict these small scales. So we have a lot of theoretical ideas about how it would work. Substantial resources, you can see. $30 million, five years, and we finished our first intensive period about six weeks ago. So everything you're going to see is preliminary, but fun, um, and we're going to do it one more time in April. 
And the point of this, and a whole lot of people, a whole lot of people involved, Tom Ferrar is the, is the lead scientist, because you can't spend $30 million without a lot of people involved. Maybe you could, but anyway. Um, one of the really unique things in this experiment which make it very appealing is aircraft remote sensing, which I haven't talked about very much. Um, we have two aircraft in this experiment, um, which do basically the same thing. They compute surface currents remotely by measuring properties of the surface waves. This guy is a radar aircraft. It measures the properties of the, wave, of, the, of the surface waves by bouncing microwaves off of them. And this guy is an optical thing. It looks at, looks at the ocean surface optically and measures the waves. And from that, um, determines surface currents. I'm telling you this because you guys have drones and they can do the same thing as this. Okay. Right. It's fun anyway. Um, remember we're talking about vertical exchange. Well, like I showed you in the swirling purple dots, you have like a stand-drone, you have this current, and the current is zero going this way, the current is zero going this way, and then it's going down in the middle. And if you measure it with an aircraft, same thing, and there's the equation. Which, um, but describe that. Just to talk about that in a little bit more detail, you have a radar or something, and you measure these small waves. You measure their phase velocity. So you say, these little waves are going in that direction relative to the water. But they're actually moving in a different way than they are than they are moved relative to the water. Therefore, that difference is the velocity. And the bigger waves measure deeper, and the little waves measure shallower. So you can measure the surface current and exactly what surface currents you use and how you average it and stuff is horribly complicated. But the idea is, is uh, straightforward in principle. And it's particularly appropriate for the comparison with surface drifters, which measure very shallow currents like that. And that's one of the things people are doing. OK, so we want to design an experiment off California to look at all these small scales. This, I think. This, I think, is either a model output or a sea surface temperature um, measurement. I'm not quite sure. But you can see there's all sorts of funny things here. Um, what, what area do we want to measure in? That polygon. Why the heck would you use that polygon? Well, OK. You got some airplane people here. Here's San Francisco. Here's, why would you have such a funny polygon? Anybody got a good guess? OK, it's because this is a missile impact zone, and this is a Air Force airplane exclusion zone. And they take the whole room and coast to themselves, except the uh, passenger aircraft coming out of San Francisco have to go somewhere. So I opened up this little window for them. That's why, that's why there. OK, and why not out here? Well, it just gets too far away. But there's no reason we couldn't go out here if we have to. Um, I skipped a slide, I think. Yes, I did skip a slide. Um, same polygon. Same story about the polygon. And this should be a movie. It should loop. Come on, movie. There we go. OK. This is the output of a state-of-the-art small-scale model. And it's being used here. You, you, you can be dazzled by this. It's being used here to illustrate the local oceanography. If you want to study something in a given region, you better understand more or less what's going on, or you're not going to be able to sample it. The oceanography that happens here is that this time of year, there's a wind coming from this direction that upwells dense water here. And then that dense water runs offshore in what are called uh, dense filaments. And then it makes a bunch of fronts and things. And then it sort of sinks under the other water. So it's a place where vertical motions are happening. We expect that. That's not new. We, the fact that, it, that there is upwelling is not news. That's just local oceanography. The fact that it moves offshore is not news. That's called mesoscale. You want to resolve tens of kilometers over a week. The fact that it makes a front, and exactly how it makes a front, is what we're studying and in detail how this all works. That's sub-mesoscale. That's research. So we're trying, but we have to measure both this big scale and that little scale at the same time. So we've started to define some scales. And we've got a tool like this to help us practice. OK, how do you measure the big scales? This is understood oceanography. The sampling requirement is span 200 kilometers at 50 kilometer resolution every five days. You use models to do that, because models know how to do this. The 
Lines are the tracks of satellites that measure the, the height of the surface of the ocean. If you take that height of the surface of the ocean and manipulate it a little bit, it's not hard. You can get the currents here and um, do that with many different models. Any given model has errors because of arbitrary assumptions that have been made. It's better to use multiple models, so we're using three different models of different resolution. Um, but we thought that, that, that you can get everywhere in the world. We, we thought we need more detailed data, so we also put out, we, we persuaded the Navy to put out, that's supposed to say this, we, they are part of us, okay? We're all together, but you're paying for this part. But they're happy to do it. They're really interested in this stuff, for fairly obvious reasons. Um, they put out pain gliders, which are focused in this region with the idea of getting it even better. Okay, good. That's, that, that's, that's straightforward, but it's quite a bit of effort to set up. So that gives us every day, more or less, we can look at this sort of thing, and we can figure out sort of what's going on. That's important. Okay, next problem is sampling the sub-mesoscale. This is a research problem. We have satellite images. Oh, this is a movie. We have, for example, satellite images that will resolve that. So here you go, look at that. There's a beautiful front, we're gonna go there. And, the, and there's some interesting wiggles, whoops, clouds. Not clouds, you know, so you know, every once in a while you have an image, and every once in a while you're working in the dark. But it's a lot better than nothing. And if we stop for a moment here, um, here's a front, actually the front we ended up looking at. I want you to focus on these little wiggles here. You can see more of those shortly, they really are there. So that leads us to an interesting feature. That's an interesting feature. The other thing you do is you take all these other toys and you focus them on this region. Now that you know where it is, and there's an example of focusing. It's, you know, these guys are sort of off, to, off target, but they're getting their act together, and eventually they're going to come over to the right place. There they go. There, I think the movie stops. Um, you can see something that's moving. If you look, you'll see something that's moving fast. The thing that's moving fast, once you get the movie going, is a ship. And you'll also see four uh, sail drones here that are in a square. The idea is to make a square and do the divergence of the square. So that's what you do. Uh, sometimes you get it right, and sometimes they're all in the wrong place. The idea is, that, but that's the idea. You get a whole lot of measurements. So that's now a 10 kilometers here. We have a dozen measurements on a couple, on a few tens of kilometers. That's enough to start resolving what we're after. OK. How the heck do you run such a complicated operation? That's a lot of stuff to keep track of, and it's easy to get confused. We had something like 80 different things in the water of 10 different types, something like 10, order 10, 5 to 10 people whose job it was to operate some sort of thing. You got it, someone's got to keep track of what's going on. What you do is you have to think about it beforehand, otherwise you'll just be confused. You have to basically set up a data system that pulls in all the data, displays it in some uniform way. Those pictures you saw were the real-time pictures we were looking at during the experiment to figure out what was going on. We used Google Earth to visualize them. You also need a social structure to support that. There was a control center. It was all done online because of the COVID, and then we liked that because then we could stay home. There was a, has to be a dedicated person, or maybe several people, whose sole job it is to look at what's going on and keep everybody straight. That was me. I enjoyed that job a lot. That gives me um, the responsibility to tell everybody else every day what I'm thinking. And we had to do a presentation. There's the slides from a particular day's presentation. And that worked very well. It turned out we really needed two meetings a day, but that's all detail. You can know, figure it out. It depends on your problem. Another interesting social thing is in your traditional oceanographic experiment, there was a ship. The ship is like the big thing. And everybody worries about the ship, like what's happening on the ship. Hey, Ben, we got 80 platform. You're just another platform. Do what you're told and tell us what you think about it. You know, so the sh chief scientist on the ship is not the chief scientist. He's just another operator who's going to make sure that the ship drives in the right way. But our chief scientist took a while to get used to the idea. He said, well, I'm just another platform. Yep. You're just another platform. But we really want to hear what you have to say. And part of the reason he was frustrated was we didn't have a good internet connection to the ship, so we couldn't hear what he had to say. And he, and he was saying, you're telling me to do stupid things, which was true. Anyway, so I've done this probably a dozen times, and there's lots to learn. 
every time I learn something different. Okay, a few preliminary conclusions about what we see. The aircraft velocities actually work. This is just amazing, and you know, this should be a big deal in the future. This is a very high resolution um, temperature image of the surface of the ocean near one of these fronts. And look, you have these little vortices. If you're a fluid dynamicist, you immediately think stirring, instability, big things, things. And then the contour lines, the lines here are streamlines at a particular moment from, a, from the velocity field computed by the ship. And there, look at that. The spiral, right there, right where it should be, it's high pass, okay? Another one sort of there, another one sort of there. You take that velocity field and you compute the vorticity of it, the rate that it's spinning, and call the vortices, bang, bang, bang. They're all spinning vortices that are sort of the right size. They have a vorticity of about twice the rotation, uh, 2F, which is about the rotation rate of the Earth. In other words, these spots here are spinning at the same rate of the Earth relative to the Earth, and they're spinning it twice as fast as the Earth, in the same direction as the Earth. There's a lot of blue and only a few red. There's a theoretical prediction that says that, that should be the case. So this is also a statistical check on whether what you're doing is right. This is really cool. The reason NASA was willing to spend, the reason NASA was willing to be persuaded to spend this much money on this was because this is a potential satellite, because what's on the aircraft could be in a satellite. So I think we can expect to see this on a satellite soon, which means you'll probably see it and I might still be alive by the time they get the satellite up. It's a long, slow, it's a long, slow process with satellites. But it's very promising. It wouldn't be this resolution because the satellite would be 10 times higher up. But it's be amazing to have these sort of things all over the world, you know, every day. That would be very cool. Okay, very detailed ocean dynamics thing. So if you take that satellite, the aircraft velocities, okay, we go back to the, we go back to the fingers. Okay, now we're now gonna look in very great detail at fingers, just to give you a feeling of what sort of stuff you can do with this. What sort of level of dynamics you can do. So this is vorticity, there's the red stuff, there's the red stuff, here's the blue stuff, that's five kilometers. And now I'm going to zoom in into the kilometer scale. Here's a little vortex going around like this, right there. All this splotchy stuff you don't need to know in detail. That's a bunch of our instruments. We got them in the right place. I don't show you the times, we didn't get them in the right place, okay? But we got them in the right place by some mixture of scale. This is temperature, that's hot, that's hot, it's cold, that's cold. The contours, this is where the velocities are pulling apart. So the water's going up here, up here, down there, down there. There's a heat flux. The warm water's going up, the cold water's going down. That's what's supposed to happen. That heat flux is what's ripping the front apart and is what's making the dense water dive under the wine water, so the warm water. That's what's supposed to happen theoretically. So this is very cool. Pretty sure this is the first heat flux measurement on these scales. And it says that the water is going down in this right here or this here at uh, 1.2 millimeters a second. That's uh, 150 meters a day or so, something like that. Okay. One of the measurement instruments that was there was one of my floats, which was right underneath that spot. Well, the water's supposed to be going down. Well, what do you know? It's going down. Good. What's the speed that it's going down? The right speed. Um, and then it's also, this is real subtlety, it's also on a constant, it's measuring the same density, so it's actually sliding along a mean um, ocean density surface, which is also what you expect. And this water is being stretched, and therefore it's going to spin faster, and this water is being compressed, and therefore it's going to spin slower, and all sorts of details. Uh, the heat flux associated with this is 1,000 watts per square meter. That's the same heat flux that's coming out of the sun on a bright sunny day. That's a big number in a, like a 15 kilometer square region. So let's just give you a flavor for the sort of stuff we could do. Oh, oh one more thing. So this is an ugly picture, but it's the same satellite photo with the uh, aircraft temperatures superimposed on it. So there, here you can see a bunch of little wiggles, which are some sort of instability that's probably starting. And then these are mature instabilities. So we don't know quite what these instabilities are, but we'll certainly sort that out. So there's a real. That's something which people have been searching for for quite a long time. Okay, remember we have this fancy state-of-the-art bottle um, that the Navy runs for us. 
Here's the output of that model at roughly the same time. Here's the front, and here are those fingers. So what do you know? The model actually makes the same thing. So we're, you know, we're in a very good position to understand them. You may note that this front is going east-west. This front is going diagonally. So it has the right feature in the wrong place. Well, that model will do that. So it might well be that in order to get these guys right, what you should be doing in the model, not you know, if you wanted to make an operational model that put things in the right place, maybe the problem is you're not getting the bigger scale right, and you need to move resources from the small scale to the big scale. And we learned that sort of thing. Okay, enough of all that. Did I say preliminary? Preliminary. The point is that by mixing lots of different types of platforms, we can measure a very wide range of scales in a, in a, in a meaningful way. And there's some sort of instabilities that have some sort of heat flux. That's good, and the models do not a bad job on it. So if you're not an oceanographer, this is just for flavor. OK. Last slide, second last slide. How will we measure the ocean in the future? Well, certainly with a great variety of tools and a large number of each type. I think that's 100% sure exactly which ones it will be. We quite don't know. Probably some of the types that we are going to use haven't been invented yet. So there's lots of opportunity, lots of, lots of, lots of opportunity in that space. We're learning how to do it. When you really have got it learned, then it gets a lot less nebulous. It's pretty nebulous. We need to think really carefully when you do this to use different types together. There's no question that you need to put different types together to make to do this right. And here's, you know, here's your vision of sort of all the different types, and there's probably other types too. And so the robots are going to take over, but I don't. So thank you very much. Someone should monitor the web questions too. Okay. So, so I, I think, I'll repeat the question because it's pretty noisy. Um, I think what you ask is what makes, what makes, what, what, why would you make a surface go through a certain size and how do you make it work right? Is that close, close enough to the question? Okay, that's actually quite a subtle question. If you just want to make a surface drifter, you could take anything, put a satellite tracker on it, throw it in the ocean, it will move somewhere. If all you want to measure is the up and down on the waves, make a wave sensor. That's really how you, a wave buoy now consists of anything that floats that isn't absolutely crazy shape, plus a GPS um, accelerometer, the type that they put in model airplanes. Because you know, that only works out to you know, a 10 second period or something. If you want to follow the currents more accurately, then you have to be quite careful. The biggest problem is the waves that go round and round have velocities of a meter a second or so typically. The velocities you're trying to measure or maybe a few you'd like it to be good to a few centimeters a second. So there's big problems with not averaging the waves right. And if you remember the funny white things, the drifters that I showed, they had a, a surface donut and then, a, and then a floppy thing at the bottom and it could do this. And that was critical. If you made them rigid, then when you got to the top of the wave, they'd sort of fall over and you'd get lots of wave rectification. So the most critical thing is that you Look at them in wave tanks or in simulations so that the wave, so that you average out the effect of the waves and that's supposed to be there. There are two types that are used now generically. One of the types I showed you that only measures the top, you know, this much of the ocean. Another type is to put a small ball at the surface, a fairly long line, and then a really big drove down there. Not a parachute, but like I said, uh, there's various things. Something that's got a lot of air or an area of the region you can take them. And just overwhelm whatever happening with the waves by a really, really big drag, factor of 20 or 30. That's the basic design. Is that the right, is that the right, answer, right answer? Okay, good. Not too easy. No? <coughs> oh, this, okay, we asked whether if you have a front, no, let me go back a little bit. If you have a front like this, 
are there long-term threats? Yes, there have to be. In fact, I'm just ignoring them because if you have a horizontal, if you have a density difference here, it will be creating some because of the rotation the pressure on one side or the other. That's the opposite. That's, fun, that's fundamental physics of the ocean. That's not going to be violated even on very small scales like this. There'll be a lot of flat currents. And there'll be vorticities here and stuff like that. And sometimes that's all you need. If you make it sharp enough, interesting, really interesting things will happen. Does those currents Say it again. Yeah. Yeah, so the hypothesis is, and I don't, I, it, something like this is more or less got to be true, that these things are instabilities of that, of the, of the uh, strong shears at the front. Whether it's this shear or that shear is, is, is a type of dynamical question that needs to be answered. But yes, there's, there's certainly, I think it's, I think it's very, it's very not unlikely that these anything other than an instability. Okay, so, so why are the relatively new treatments of the ocean water you know, compared to the surface uh, and the ocean? Why do you have uh, what are the challenges and uh, yeah. things to water? He, he wants to know why people like to measure near the surface as opposed to in the deep ocean, why it's a well, number one, it's a lot, it, it, because the answer is it's a whole lot harder. The um, pressures at the bottom of the ocean are six bars. If you start calculating how much of a, how much, how, if you wanted to have some sort of instrument that was at atmospheric pressure and you wanted to build a pressure case, it's really massive, really difficult engineering to make so. It's not impossible, but it's a, if you want to go to a, yeah, this, this won't go. This won't go to 100 meters. But something that isn't very much more difficult to make than this can go to 100 meters in the ocean, and you can put some some instruments in it. You can measure something. If you want to go to the bottom of the ocean, you really have to engineer it. There's a lot of crazy stuff they do, like ceramic ceramic balls. Uh, the, the, if you want to send stuff to the bottom of the ocean and you don't care too much about what it looks like, a glass ball about this big, sintered glass. I mean. Uh, roughened glass that sticks together is probably the simplest pressure case because glass is really, really strong. Um, and then you try to figure out how to drill holes in the glass that don't concentrate the, uh, the, the um, stresses it up that anything bad will happen, and that's all worked out. But that's an example. That's an example of how hard it is. And so, it, you know, so the, for instance, the um, Indian goal to build a 6,000 meter submersible, the, you know, that's, a, that's a real technical challenge. To Oh, oh yeah, you, there's no question you can do it, and mooring technology is in particular very well developed, but it's just a whole lot harder than the surface, and um, that's why. So unless you have a really good reason, it's, it's easier to work near the surface, and if you're interested in air um, oh, things like things like uh, El Nino, Southern Oscillation, they're all pretty shy. Another way of thinking about it is for all the air-sea interaction and climate things, the longer you wait, you know, the atmosphere changes. Therefore, it puts some heat in the ocean. That heat eventually changes the atmosphere. That's the sort of feedback. Like, oh, the wind blows, and the wind blows and pushes the heat around. The longer you wait, the deeper the heat goes. So if you want to look at short time things, you only have to look at the upper ocean. If you want to look at, like, day-night. Day-night only goes to about 10 meters. Um, uh, El Nino goes to, you know, that southern oscillation might go to 100 meters. If, if you, the, radioactive, the radioactive bomb stuff that was put in the ocean during the bomb testing in the early 60s can be traced around the ocean. And in part, some parts of the world, it's at the, it's at the bottom of the ocean and it's moving south. But it has, by no means is that filled up the whole bottom of the ocean. Yet. And that's now... I think... Almost everyone in this room was born after the test ban treaty. It used to be, I could say, that the LP, I think almost everyone was, so you guys were not subject to the radioactivity of, of the early 60s. I think that's right for, except a few gray-haired people, maybe. <laughs> okay, you missed a radioactive over there. <laughs>
Yeah, so what do you, what do you ask? Is, is the sub mesoscale scale more, uh, more three-dimensional and whether that's an interesting thing? Um, certainly the larger scale stuff has a, for very good dynamical reasons, has a very broad aspect ratio. Three-dimensionality is a bit of a strange idea. It, 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 forgive me, but if you like go from the bottom, from the southern, from the south, but no south pole, the coast of Antarctica to Norway, and you compress that, you know, it's a very small, you know, compress it by a factor of a million in aspect ratio or something like that. You know, then there's lots of steep isobic nodes and lots of stuff that's moving up and down. But 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 it's very, very, very flat. Both because the ocean is very thin and wide and because the navigating tends to be that way. But it is indeed true that these sort of motions are are, are more three-dimensional than than the mesoscale ones. And in particular, if you go to the next scale down. 100 meters and smaller, where the flow is truly turbulent, then it's one to one. You know, particle motions in the turbulent boundary layer are round, more or less. So once you get down to that scale, it really is fully three dimensional. You know, like the weight in the, in the, in the, like the flow in the weight of a sphere. It's really so if you think that was the question, yeah. yeah. So this one that you're kind of showing is, uh, you think it's No, no, it's definitely three dimensional. Definitely three-dimensional. Um, well, you I mean you, you can sort of see it here. Looks the wrong way. I mean, with, what, with, what I'm saying is that par parcels of water are sliding up and down here, and this this is just this is a section. This is a section that is this here. So I'm making a section here, and I see that thing, but yet there's clearly. Um, strong gradients in that direction. So this is a fully free dimensional structure. With a very strange set of aspect ratios. I don't know, no, I don't know why it's long and skinny like that. But it's also it's long and skinny like that, and it's also tilting downward like that in some way that I haven't sorted out. Sure. So there's an interesting fluid dynamics problem there for sure. I don't know what it is. It's about so it's six weeks. And once we quit, what's and I've been here, I've been talking to you guys. Do we have some online questions? Yeah, okay, are there any other questions? Pardon me? Didn't you already ask the question? <laughs> oh, oh, he wants to know how do you get real time data underwater? The short answer is not easily. The only way to do it is to send the data back acoustically. And that works. The ocean is an extremely difficult medium for acoustic transmission because uh, it's, a, it's a very noisy and irregular, not noisy, irregular wave guide. But that can be done. The tsunami monitoring, the tsunami buoy system, which the DNA maintains a good part of, works that way. Because basically, it basically has got a, I should ask you, but um, it's basically got a thing on the bottom of the ocean that's, that, that's looking for both seismic, seismic stuff and the tsunami going by. And all that really has to do is send, you know, 100 bytes of data that says, tsunami's coming, and here's something about it. And that can be done with an acoustic modem that sends, you know, a coded pulse that would be familiar, a very, very heavily coded and error corrected pulse that take care of all the problems and send it lots of times. So that's an example. Okay, online questions? Yeah, I think the first question is from uh, Mr. Madhul Kautar. This is, can't we use some piece of scale parameterization techniques? Why do we need a piece of scale measurement? Ooh, ooh, he wanted to know. He says, well, what do you say? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to bag on what the question is. He says, um, I'm a theoretician, and I think I know the equations, and I've solved them. We don't need any measurements because, I, because I'm right. Um, I don't think we know that he's, the short answer is I don't think uh, it was not fair, but I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the problem is that all of these sort of parameterizations ha have approximations and have things that are neglected. But there's no question, to be more serious about it, there's, I didn't mention it, but there's no question that thinking about these sort of observations and thinking about what we're doing 
is very strongly influenced by that type of work, by parameterizations. And one of the things that will happen on a longer time scale than the six weeks since we made this measurement is to try to test those and try to see if for see if you can parameterize them. And that's certainly an important goal. There's no question about that. So can you tell me something more on the drifter? In one of your slides, you mentioned about four to five types of drifters. What are they? I have used only surface velocity program drifter, drop, drops at 50 meters. Okay. Yeah, okay, so I mentioned this before, but I didn't use all the magic word didn't use all the magic words. So there's a thing, just like there's a global Argo program that has Argo floats that contributed by many different companies, there's a thing called the Surface Velocity Program. It uses a standard type of drifter, SVP, Surface Velocity Program drifter, which consists of a small ball at the surface and then a, um, what's called a holy sock. If you would imagine a sock, like on your feet, that had a, Oh, you know, okay, you know those tunnels, the, the tunnels that, you, that, are, that have rings, they have a ring of metal or plastic, and then fabric, and you can call, crawl through the tunnel. It's fun, and, and you can also collapse it down to a ring. They take that, and it's like a meter across and, 50, and like 10 meters long, so a very, very big area. You tie, you tie that to a line that goes up to the surface drifter. It's centered on 15 meters. It goes from like... I don't know how long it is, five meters long, so it's 15 and a half to 17 and a half or something like that. And then that has a whole lot of drag, and they make sure that the drag duration, the drag ratio between that thing and the surface ball is a factor of 20 or more. Um, and that's a surface velocity drifter. But it doesn't measure the surface velocity, it measures the velocity at 15 meters. And for example, if you use it in the Bay of Bengal, where the surface, where the freshwater squishes down the surface layer down to a few meters, you're not measuring the velocity of the surface at all. On the other hand, most places in the world, the surface layer is deeper than 15 meters, and the reason that they chose 15 meters is it's out of the near surface wave zone, which tends to mess everything up. So that's why they, for most of the world, that's a good measurement of the surface velocity or something like it. The other type is the one I will show you the picture of, something that's designed to measure very near the surface, the top meter or so. And I showed you, I showed you the little white plastic ones, and there are other ones that use fabric, and those that just near surface ones. And you can make some. So they measure the top meter. And you make some which are very near the surface, like only like this thick. And those would like to be designed to measure the motion of an oil slick or something. So those are three different types. And the reason I said six or eight is well, I was lazy, and also because they're different manufacturers which have different details. But those, that's the philosophy of the, oh yeah, sorry. Some people try having a small surface ball and then a, the same sort of holy sock drove, but put it 100 meters down. As you, uh, as you start getting deeper and deeper, the, um, the cable starts having a longer and longer drag. One thing you have to realize is that the drag coefficient of a circular cylinder is really big. So it doesn't take very much cable to end up being a whole lot of area. And, you know, 100 meters is actually pretty long. So the, as you get deeper and deeper, it becomes less and less clear how well it's actually following the water in the depth of the drone. So it did, generally, it, it's confined to the top 50 meters or something like that. is I've been talking, I have not talked at all about vertical mixing to change the temperature. The sun is shining and, uh, and the wind is blowing and things are getting heated and cooled a lot. How important of that did we measure that? And she's absolutely right that that's a factor here. Um, and there's, there's no question that that, play, that, that that plays a role. Um, this Place and season was chosen, so that's probably not a really dominant effect, but it's certainly true that the interplay 
between these sort of effects and the vertical flex, vertical flex that she was mentioning is a, is a really important question. Uh, he's, he, well, he's, he's God, but um, in, in, the, in, the, in the Bay of Bengal, in particular, the interplay between vertical processes that are mixing, say, the fresh water down and horizontal processes and all those fronts that are mixing it sideways is a really critical part of the problem probably one of the things that models get wrong and a fairly major motivation for doing this sort of study. Is that, did I get any close to the answer? No, I missed it. Oh, okay. Um, she would, I think she was asking how much difference is there between, for example, Oh, well, here we go. There, that's a, that, this, is, this is a state-of-the-art prediction of what we should see. Okay, there it is. That, you know, that's a Navy model with extra data to assimilate. It's all assimilated. Well, uh, on, some, on a roughly similar scale, that's what we measured, and that's what the model predicted. And it, it, put, the fr it put the front in the wrong place. It put a front here. It puts some small scale features, it gets the temperature roughly right, but exactly what it puts where wasn't quite right. And that's very typical. You can learn a lot, and whether it got these things in detail right, we don't know yet. So, the answer, so that's fairly typically what we see when you're looking at this. It gets the features right, but often puts them in the wrong place, and I don't think we know yet how you would fix it. How much information would you need to fix it? But even asking that question and, under, and answering the question in that way is progress. I mean, sorry, posing the question in that way is progress, and maybe this will be a contribution to that. So I think... Uh, Perhaps we can Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you all. It was fine.